To open the conference, we start with gold. Everyone knows what gold is. It's gold. It's a real metal. It's a gold ring. It's a gold nugget. Worth your weight in gold. And then we'll also talk about some strange things called Ripple and Dash and Ethereum. No, I thought they might be the names for Teletubbies, but I believe there's something else. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. He is Chief Economist of Australia's largest independent bullion dealer, dealer, ABC Bullion. To address the topic of gold, cryptocurrencies and speculating on the future of money, would you please join me in welcoming ABC Bullion's Jordan Alessio. Thanks, Andrew, for the, uh, the warm introduction and uh, for the opportunity to, to come along here this morning and, and talk about the future of money. It's a, a pretty heavy topic at any time, especially at 9am when, when people are working through their first coffee. So thanks everyone as well who, who's made it along. Um, over the next 30 minutes, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the dollar, uh, a little bit more about gold, but I'll spend most of my time talking about Bitcoin. Uh, and Bitcoin really, I, when I talk about Bitcoin, I'm, I'm referring to really the whole cryptocurrency universe um, as a whole. It's obviously been a, a really exciting space in particular over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, actually, Andrew, I'm going to need the uh, clicker if you've got it, mate. If someone at the back's got one. Thank you. Um, so very exciting space over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, worth remembering that January 2017, the, the price of Bitcoin itself was, was still struggling to get above $1,000 per coin. Um, it obviously 20 bagged over the, the course of last year um, and basically peaked at around US $20,000 per coin around, the, around Christmas time. Um, as exciting as that is, um, you can see what's happened since. Prices have corrected around 70%, at one point down to around $6,000, bounced back to around 10. And I think this morning um, coming in here in, in an Uber, it was, oh, I had a quick look and it was around $8,500 US dollars per coin. Uh, I can tell you that across the course of last year, it wasn't just the price of Bitcoin that rallied. Obviously, a lot of other cryptocurrencies did as well. But in terms of the impact on the precious metal space, uh, when it comes to the futures market, ETF flows and the like, very, very insignificant, um, the, the impact of Bitcoin. But for retail physical bar and coin uh, demand across the, the Western world, including in, here in Australia, it was very, very profound. Uh, go back to when... Um, Brexit happened when Trump was entering the White House. For every hundred dollars of sales that we might, or turnover that we might do with our retail clients, roughly ninety dollars of it was sales, and ten dollars of it was buying back metal. Mostly due to Bitcoin. By the end of last year, that had gone to about 50/50. So there was a huge amount of physical gold that was sold back to bullion dealers for people to go and punt on the price of Bitcoin and other cryptos. Um, unfortunately given the majority of that flow didn't occur until Q4 of last year. Most of those investors, even though the price of Bitcoin is still up 10 times over what it was 12 months ago, most investors are probably down on their investment because they didn't get in until around the, the December mark. Now, my personal view, I, I'm, I'm really excited by the technology behind Bitcoin. I think it's facilitating a really, really important conversation about what money is meant to be um, and what an ideal form of money looks like. Uh, but despite that excitement, I think Bitcoin is going to fail miserably in its supposed quest to usurp the current fiat currency system and to usurp gold. And to explain that over the next 25 minutes, I'll get a cheeky reference into the upcoming royal wedding. Um, I'll share a couple of anecdotes from our clients at ABC Bullion, and I make a very solemn promise that I'm going to share with you at the end of this, this presentation what will undoubtedly be the most boring chart you'll see in the next two days. So it's also an appropriate time to be talking about um, the future of money, because um, co by coincidence, it's exactly 30 years since that front cover graced The Economist. So back in January of 1988, there was an article which, talked, which suggested that 30 years from now, i.e. 2018, the world would transition to a global currency and that people would no longer be using yen or dollars or Deutschmarks, the euro didn't even exist back then, um, and that instead there would just be one global currency. And the image itself is kind of interesting because you've got this gold coin, this golden phoenix behind it, 
and burning paper currency at the base. And something that's particularly relevant, I think, in the last 10 years, given the onset of the global financial crisis, the um, response of not just the Federal Reserve, but the ECB, the Bank of Japan, you name it, in terms of huge stimulus through quantitative easing that we've seen over, over the last decade, which has caused people to sort of ask, you know, really how sustainable is fiat currency? And there's also, it's also no coincidence that Bitcoin was created in the aftermath of the GFC, the reduction of interest rates to essentially zero all around the world. Um, but if we, if we sort of, I suppose, take a view and go back a little bit further than just the last 10 years, the, the issue with, with fiat currency uh, has been one that's been building over a long time. Um, that chart that you can see there now shows the purchasing power of the US dollar in the, the 100 years from the period that the Federal Reserve was created in 1913. And from 1913 to 2013, you can see that the purchasing power of the dollar, I think it's quite, quite neat the way this chart was created, has dropped by around 95%. You don't need a degree in economics. You don't need to be a, you know, a market historian or anything. It, there's no conspiracy here. This is how fiat currencies are designed. They're meant to lose value over time, which is why they don't tend to last. So the question becomes, what replaces it? If, if, if the dollar's not perfect money and if the dollar won't last, what's going to come next? And without wanting to, to spend a huge amount of time on it, it is worth spending maybe two or three minutes just saying, well, OK, what, what are the functions of ideal money? What would we like money to do? And as well, what are the characteristics that something would need in order to be ideal money? So it's meant to serve three functions in an economy. It's meant to be a unit of account, it's meant to be a medium of exchange, and it's meant to be a store of value. As the chart before you made pretty clear, whilst the dollar does a great job as a unit of account and a medium of exchange, it's a horrible store of value. When it comes to Bitcoin, well, so far, it's not really a unit of account. It's not really a medium of exchange. And it's far too early to really say whether it's a store of value. It's been a fantastic speculative investment uh, for people that were long for, you know, for, for a few years. And there's still huge opportunity to speculate in it on both the long and the short, so on, on, on both the long and the short side. But given it hasn't even survived one credit cycle yet, it's far too early to, stay, to say that it's a store of value. And then when we look at gold, well, we can say that gold's not really a unit of account in any meaningful way in day-to-day -day commerce anymore, and it's also not really a medium of exchange anymore. But it's a terrific store of value. Everybody knows that. Andrew attested to that at the very start. So if we're being honest and we're looking at the, the monetary alternatives that are out there in the world right now, nothing really serves the function of ideal money at this point. The question is, which one of these things could be ideal money. And then you've got to go, well, let's have a look at what the characteristics of ideal money are. And there were seven. And these seven, these seven principles or characteristics of ideal money were written about by Plato thousands of years ago. They're nothing new. Money's not some amazingly new concept that we've developed in our time. For something to work as ideal money, it's got to be durable, divisible, portable, recognisable, acceptable, consistent and intrinsically valuable. Again, if we look at the dollar, ticks the first six has no chance of lasting because it fails the seventh. If we look at Bitcoin, it definitely fits the first five. It's durable, it's divisible, it's portable, it's recognisable, and it's growing in acceptance. So that's fine. When it comes to consistency, not really. One Bitcoin is the same as any other Bitcoin. But in the last year, there were four what they call forks or splits off the, off the blockchain. So there's now Bitcoin, there's Bitcoin Cash, there's Bitcoin Gold, I believe there's even a Bitcoin Diamond, though that one hasn't got anywhere near as much media attention. All of which are moving forward in their own way, different price characteristics, different technological innovations, you name it. So unlike a dollar, which is just a dollar, or unlike an ounce of gold, which is just an ounce of gold, there's no different types of ounces of gold, even if you put a different stamp on it, Bitcoin itself is not consistent, and there's not really any intrinsic value to it as well. Unlike gold, you can't wear it as jewellery, it doesn't have any industrial use, you name it. If we look at gold itself, gold actually does fit all seven characteristics. It can perform all seven functions. So it was a political decision in 1971 
to come off the gold standard. It wasn't that gold all of a sudden stopped working as money. And it should be no surprise, given, given gold's characteristics, it's money, or given that it, that it satisfies the characteristics, that if we look back over the last 2,000 years, that it has been by far the primary monetary asset that we've used. You can see the, the chart behind me, which came from a 2010 study by the World Bank, um, Roman Aureus, the, the Salidas from Byzantine times, Florence, the Dutch, the, the Spanish, the British, they all use some kind of gold coin as their currency right up until the 20th century and the emergence of the US dollar. So a lot of traditional economists and finance commentators and, and certainly what I was taught at school said, yeah, gold was money, but it's too archaic now. And so we moved to the US dollar paper currency. That's the way of the future. But it's worth reflecting just for a moment on why the world in the aftermath of the Second World War was willing to accept the dollar as the global reserve currency, right? Was it just because they had that much faith in the military might of the United States and the, and the um, responsibility of the US Treasury? Or was it because the United States held over 20,000 tonnes of gold in their reserves at the time and more than 60% of all total central bank gold holdings at the end of the Second World War? And that's what you can see on the chart behind me, the, the, uh, the orange lines mark the total tonnage of gold that was held by the United States which has sadly dropped from 20,000 to about 8,000 tonnes from 1945 to 1970, and the percentage of total foreign exchange reserves, sorry, total gold reserves that all central banks held. Alan Greenspan, who's the longest serving uh, governor of the Fed, stated it unequivocally that the reason the world was willing to accept the dollar was because the dollar was backed by gold. Now, of course, the US defaulted on that promise about 45 years ago and we're living with the consequences or, or have been living with the consequences since. Some positive, some quite negative. So, sp spent enough time talking about the dollar and, and spent a bit of time talking about gold, though I'll come back to it. So if we delve into Bitcoin itself, I think we can, I can, I'm very confident in saying that the dollar's not going to last in its current form and, and really no fiat currency will. Some kind of change will have to happen. We know gold works. The real question that we want to sort of try and figure out is, is Bitcoin a real threat to gold? Is it a real potential replacement um, in, in any meaningful way? And my view is that whilst Bitcoin is seen as money today, that won't last for a number of key reasons. And to explain that, it's first worth just for a second looking at what the supposed promises of Bitcoin are. What does Bitcoin supposedly allow people to do? Well, it's supposed to be incredibly efficient. It's supposed to be anonymous. It's supposed to be decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, so you can remove all intermediaries and it has a fixed supply. Those are the key selling points, right? Now, pretty much all of them are false in some way, and most importantly, for it to be used meaningfully in commerce, nearly all of these things have to disappear. And I'll give you some examples to, um, to, to go through that. So let's deal with the efficiency part first. In theory, you can transfer money really quickly anywhere around the world. In practice, the Bitcoin blockchain struggles to process 10 transactions per second. As a comparison, Visa tr can do 24,000 transactions per second. So when you go and buy your morning coffee and you can just tap and go, imagine having to wait for two hours while the transaction settles before you can walk off. That's what would happen if there were no intermediary supporting Bitcoin. So it's actually incredibly slow to use. It's not efficient in any meaningful way. It's also expensive to use. So when, when we hear, and I'm guilty of it myself earlier in the day, I said you know, the, the price of Bitcoin was $20,000 at the end of last year. Well, it depends what exchange you look at. So it's traded on multiple exchanges, and of course you can transact just between a, a hum, human being to human being without even using an exchange. But there is massive, massive differences between the prices on the exchanges, and especially between the price quoted on an exchange and what you can get for it if you want to use it in the real world. So CoinSpot and BTC Markets uh, are two pretty popular exchanges. And when I did this study as part of a really big report in November last year, these are Aussie dollar prices, there was roughly a $1,000 gap between what CoinSpot was quoting Bitcoin at and what Bitcoin Markets was quote, BTC Markets was quoting the price at. Most importantly though, Look at the price for the thing that I've called Living Room of Satoshi, or LROS. Now, this is a pretty cool little business. They actually allow people to pay their utility bills and the like 
using Bitcoin. So you transfer Bitcoin to them and then they sort out paying your bill via BPay with whoever, you know, your electricity bill or if you wanted to buy an ounce of gold from ABC, you can do that. But the thing is, living room of Satoshi, if you actually tried to give them a Bitcoin in order to pay a bill, they were only going to give you $21,317 for that Bitcoin. So the spread between what an exchange is quoting the price of Bitcoin at and what it's actually useful for in real life was up to 15%. If that's the future of money, things are going to slow down big time in, in terms of the commerce that we can do. Moving on from that, this is a real problem. It's irreversible. So every single day, thousands of transactions around the world, probably tens of thousands of transactions go wrong due to basic human error or in some cases fraud. Now, the banking system has the ability to claw false transactions back. You pay money to the wrong account, like you, can, you can fix that, right? Bitcoin, you can't. Once a transaction has gone through, there is no way of reversing it. That is a major flaw for any financial system because, because mistakes happen, right? And there needs to be a process by which you can correct that. Maybe another crypto will solve that, but the way Bitcoin's made can't be done. This is probably my favourite one, though. The issue of decentralisation. So, again, the, the problem with uh, the Federal Reserve, fiat currency, central banks as, as, it, as, it, as they operate today is that we have no say over what they do. All the power is centralised, right? The supposed beauty of Bitcoin is that it's decentralised and everybody has a say in how the network develops and everybody can own it. Now, in theory, that's true, but in practice, 4% of Bitcoin addresses own 97% of all the Bitcoin that's been created, right? Now, hardly anyone in the world owns Bitcoin at all, right? Of all the Bitcoin that does exist, it is all concentrated in very, very few hands. Now, a few Bitcoin, uh, I, I suppose, uh, uh, bulls and those, um, those that really like Bitcoin, that are really excited by it, they'll say, Jordan, that's technically speaking a, a, little, bit, a little bit misleading because some of the Bitcoin exchanges, they actually own, they, they have one address, they own Bitcoin on behalf of all of their investors, right? I'm going to repeat that. The exchange owns the Bitcoin on behalf of the investors. Think of the governance and the risk that that brings into trading in this asset, right? That would be the equivalent of the Australian Stock Exchange saying, guys, from now on, it's too risky for you to own shares direct in Telstra or CBA or any other blue chip stock. So what we're going to do, we're going to take, we're going to own all the shares and we're going to let you trade claims on the shares. And there will be no audit or accountability to guarantee that the total claims that you think you have on CBA match the amount of shares that we actually own, right? That's actually how Bitcoin exchanges operate. So there is a massive centralisation issue and a massive governance issue as well, which has is, which is already caused problems with exchanges being hacked, exchanges just closing up and the owners running off with the Bitcoin. You've got no way of stopping them if they do that. So it's another, another major issue with it. And this is probably uh, another one of the, uh, the, the, the key issues. The idea of Bitcoin mining. And I, I love the idea of Bitcoin mining. It really helps drive the illusion of what Bitcoin is, because it kind of sounds like gold, right? You have to mine for gold, you have to mine for Bitcoin. What these Bitcoin miners essentially do is perform the computational work required to lock transactions into the blockchain. And the way that they are rewarded is they are given new Bitcoins as, that, as those transactions get locked into the blockchain, right? That's the way they're remunerated, the way they are economically incentivized to do the work that they do. Now, that works fantastically while the price of Bitcoin is going up. Doesn't work so well if the price of Bitcoin is going down. The most important thing, though, is it's a complete dead end. Because if there's only ever going to be 21 million, 21 million Bitcoin, then what do you do when the Bitcoin runs out? How do you incentivize these people to perform the work necessary to allow transactions to take place. You're going to have to pay them a transaction fee. Now, maybe I'm oversimplifying things, but that sounds a heck of a lot like what we do pay banks to do right now, right? So this whole idea of Bitcoin mining is a, is a dead end. It works for now, but there's no, there's no future in it. 
And that's why, as a monetary media, Bitcoin is practically useless. And I'll use a couple of examples here to explain this. So let's just, this is, this is a real story that affected a client of ABC Bullion that bought some Bitcoin. And I'll talk through how, talk through how this happened um, to explain just how cumbersome the process is and how, how unscalable it is. He, he was interested in it and he thought, you know what, I'm going to punt two grand, I'm going to buy some Bitcoin. And he found some guy through a WhatsApp chat group, people that were all interested in it. And the guy said, yeah, I'll sell you 2,000 Bitcoin. Uh, I'll sell you $2,000 worth of Bitcoin. Now, bear in mind, these people don't know each other via a WhatsApp group. There's no, if you transfer money to someone and they don't transfer you the Bitcoin, there's really no recourse you've got, right? So, who have, if that guy had given you his bank account, would you just transfer him the Australian dollars if he couldn't guarantee you were going to get the Bitcoin back? No way, right? Commerce doesn't... You, there's no way anyone would do that commerce in that way. So what they agreed to do was to meet at the casino, which is a really appropriate location, I think, given the transaction that was taking place. I said, all right, so talk me through it. What, what did you do then? He said, well, we, we met up and we sat down and um, he said, okay, I'll, what's, your, what's your Bitcoin address? I'll transfer you the Bitcoin you give me the $2,000. The guy said, okay, no problems. So he handed over the two grand. I said, okay, so did you just get up and walk away at that point? The transaction's done? It's like, absolutely no way. We both had to sit there for three hours until the Bitcoin was transferred into my address, right? So this is, if, if this is how the, the, I suppose, commerce is going to work going forward, then we're basically back to a barter system where you can only do business with people in your local village, right? Because there is no way people are going to transfer wealth or claims of wealth or real assets, right, if they have no way of making sure they're going to be compensated on the other side of a transaction. So that's a major problem with Bitcoin. And the other one, and this has actually happened in Australia and definitely in the United States, is just think, of the, just think about the concept of buying a house with Bitcoin in, in, in Australia. So let's assume... I've bought, I think, I'd need a, I think I'd have needed 100 Bitcoin. Let's say I bought them, you know, two years ago and they went to $10,000 and I thought, you know what, well, that's a million bucks. I can buy a crappy Sydney apartment with that, right? So I'm going to do that and I'm going to buy it off my colleague, Wardy, because he owns five... No, <laughs> um, so <laughs> he wishes. <laughs> so I say, to, I say, Wardy, I'm going to give you the, thousand, the 100 Bitcoin, you give me the house. He says, okay, no problems. And I think, fantastic, I've now used my Bitcoin, I've made 900 grand profit, never had to go into the financial system, hopefully don't have to pay tax on it, how good is this, right? Now I go to register title in my name with the New South Wales State Government. Do you think they're going to let me say, oh, don't worry about it, I just paid in Bitcoin? And actually, you, know, you can't charge me stamp duty? because I paid in Bitcoin, not dollars? Absolutely no way. I'm going to have to declare an Australian dollar value for the, for the house, right? I'm going to have to pay stamp duty on it. At that point, the tax office is probably going to find out, Jesus, if this guy paid with Bitcoin, he probably made a huge capital gain on it. We better go have a look at that as well. So the idea of being able to do meaningful commerce anonymously, peer-to-peer, -peer, and sort of get outside the sort of regulatory environment that we have to operate in is just crazy. That's not, that's not going to happen. So for all those reasons, Bitcoin has got, has got some real problems as it, as it attempts to grow and, and take over the monetary universe. Um, but the last, last, but by no means least, and this is leading onto that really boring slide I was going to talk about, last by no means least, the, the main reason, or the main problem with Bitcoin is this issue around the fixed supply. Now, if I can make a, a bit of a, a, bit of a um, uh, I, I suppose, controversial analogy, Australia has a problem with a lot of people being overweight. It's a, we have a real health issue with obesity and, and, and excessive weight. It's, uh, now, we all know that's a problem, right? Anyone, anyone can understand that, that excessive weight is a problem. Anorexia and bulimia are not the solution, right? So, sorry if it's a confronting example, but it illustrates the point. When it comes to money, right, we know, we, we can look at what's happening in Venezuela today, what's happened in Zimbabwe, what happened in Germany in the past, countless examples through history. We know the problems that are caused when money can be created out of nothing and the supply is infinite. That does not mean the supply being fixed is the solution, right? 
if we think about what money is, it is a claim on the productive goods and services that we produce in the economy. So saying there should be an upper limit of only 21 million bitcoins, that there's only ever going to be this much money, you might as well say there's only ever going to be this much goods and services, right? And once we get to a certain point that we can't produce any more. It is completely crazy and it also is the exact opposite of what gold is. The gold supply has been growing incrementally for thousands of years. It's not fixed, it's stable. And that's a fundamental difference between gold and between Bitcoin. And to illustrate this, or to, as another way of illustrating the point, there's a, a really good story that, that people in the gold space, I, I've used it myself a couple of times, like to tell to illustrate how gold protects purchasing power. And what they say is, you know, back in Roman times, the, the very best senators and, and, and most wealthy businessmen, if they'd have spent an ounce of gold, they would have been able to have the most finely embroidered toga and sandals and you name Made it for them, right? And if you compare that to modern times, if you wanted to wear the most beautiful suit and hopefully be as good looking as that guy is, then one ounce of gold will do the trick for you as well, right? And the, the illustration, it's quite a neat one, is that gold protects purchasing power over a very, very long time period. Flip the argument on its head though, and what does it also tell you about the long run return of gold? We have decades like the 70s where gold goes incredibly well, decades like the 80s and 90s where it doesn't do much. My personal view is the next decade it'll do incredibly well again. But over the long run, the long run return of gold, and we have 6,000 years of data, there's the return on gold. That's the most boring chart you'll see, right? It does nothing, it protects wealth because that's what money's meant to do. It's a way of storing the value that you own Right? And then you get to choose to go and invest it in productive enterprise or consume goods and services. The idea that you can just hold money and the money itself will make you rich is crazy. The only way to make money is invest your own time and labour or invest your accumulated capital in the time and the labour of other productive people. So when people say Bitcoin, because there's only going to be 21 million of them, is going to constantly rise in price, as more and more goods and services chase it, is just absolute madness. The purpose of money is not to create wealth, it should be to store wealth and to facilitate, to facilitate commerce. So, you know, when I look at these three monetary instruments, it's very clear that the dollar fiat currencies as a whole, in their current form, will not last. Doesn't mean chaos will ensue like some people would argue, but they won't last, there's, there's no way they will. Bitcoin is a wonderfully marketed illusion, by all means speculate, because you can make money on the long and the short side in it, but it is not going to usurp either fiat currency or gold, and gold is the definite asset or the one asset that you can be very sure will endure. Thank you very much for your time.